believe that there are some keys to getting prayers answered in the spirit. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, if you are tired of prayers being unanswered, you need to pay attention to what I'm preaching to you tonight because I'm going to give you something that gives you a key on how to get prayers answered from God. There was a very powerful prophet that lived back in the 50s and 60s, died way too young. His name was Verbal Bean. He was a very powerful man of God. He was a man of prayer. He, he was a powerful powerful man of prayer. He said there were two types of prayers that God answers. He said there are two types of praying that will get God's attention. He said the first type of prayer that God answers is a memorial prayer. It's something that you pray about over and over and over and then God answers it. He said like Cornelius when he prayed so many times that the angel of the Lord said your prayer and your giving has come up as a memorial before God. He said it was like this he said if a man wanted to buy a suit but could not afford the suit he would go into the suit store with the money he had and put the suit on layaway with the funds that he had next time he got paid he would put some more funds down on the suit he would not leave with the suit he would leave without the suit each time he went in to make a payment but the more payments he made on the suit when he could make them there would become a day when he would finally pay off the suit and when the last payment was made he could take what he had been paying for home with him he said that's how it is in your prayer life you can be praying about something over and over and over and not take the answer home if you keep praying and you keep believing there's gonna come a day when you would bring the answer home with you because you've paid it in full <laughs> hallelujah Good morning, everybody. Great to be back at Faith Tabernacle. You kind of have your own little utopia right here. Amen. If you're a guest today, would you just slip your hand up? We're going to give you another big hand clap because you took the time to come. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. I love coming to New England this time of the year. With emphasis on this time of the year. Because every once in a while, you get one of those good old-fashioned New England crisp, uh, winters. And I've learned that uh, rain is easier to shovel. <laughs> and uh, I am originally from New Brunswick, Canada. Just up the road, about 11 hours. And uh, I wasn't born in the South. But I got there as soon as I could. <laughs> but in good old Louisiana, we have two seasons. Two climates, hot and then hotter. Amen. It's a privilege to be here with Pastor Kent Elliott and his sweet wife and family, the leadership team, the, the additions to the leadership team, and to all of you wonderful members. Preachers get paid to be good, but saints are good for nothing. You don't get paid to come, made to come little play on words, I took a chance on it. <laughs> Marilyn sends her greetings, and uh, there's only one Marilyn, that's my brown hair, brown eyed gal. <laughs> and uh, since I was here, well actually, the week after the wedding I came, and uh, you helped me get through that, well we have a year in. What do you think about them? I'm still thinking. <laughs> Trust but verify. Now, I, f I believe he's a fine young man. They, the good news is, without my coaching, they purchased a home 1.2 miles from my place. <laughs> and now my, eldest, my oldest child, who's not married, she has just purchased a house, so Marilyn is helping her do all of that. So never underestimate the role of a woman. First of all, having children. Men, say amen. Aren't we glad that we were not called for that? I think that women are more resilient. I think that they have, in some times, a lot more backbone and, uh, and all the women. So women, tell your husbands that you have to be here Tuesday night for the service. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll read verse 1 through 4. I want to thank the <clears throat> IT team, especially Sister Patrice, for helping me this morning. 
And uh, we're going to take about 30 minutes and share something that I feel that God wants to speak to you and it will be a great blessing to you. Amen? Amen. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And we know where there is smoke. And since with the, with the type message I'm going to preach, I'm going to request that the media team not put the text back up. We're going to refer to it a little bit later on, but we won't refer to it up on the screen. This morning we're going to speak for just a few moments on oblivious to the obvious. Amen. Lord God, I'm going to ask that you'll let a strong anointing come in this house. We speak anointing. We speak faith. We speak the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. We declare that lives are going to be changed today. This is going to be a great day at Faith Tabernacle. And all of God's people in agreement raised their hands and said, Amen. Amen. Now would you lay your Bible down and give the Lord about a 30 second thunderous round of applause. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. And I know you're going to help me this morning. That's what you always do at Faith Tabernacle. Hallelujah. Oh, that sounds good. The atmosphere has changed. You have invited him in. He's everywhere present, nowhere absent. He was here. But you're inviting His manifest presence. You have pushed aside everything you were dealing with before you walked in here. You are acting like you are not intimidated at all for the Holy Spirit to rule and reign and for Jesus to establish His kingdom in this house today. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> if you'll allow me just to set the table for this text, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 down through verse 4, what in the world was he referring to when he talked about in the year that King Uzziah died? So here it is. Uzziah was 16 years of age when he stepped onto the throne over Judah. He reigned for 52 years. The Bible says he did that, was, that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. And we know that righteousness exalts a nation. It appears that Zechariah was the main prophet that spoke into his life. And everyone needs the word of God spoken into their lives. Even kings. During his reign, Judah prospered. Some things he did, he fortified the towers, and he strengthened the armies, and by doing so, he defeated the Philistines. And because he was so creative and innovative and progressive, he employed skilled men to develop certain types of weaponry. And because he had a great love for the land, he promoted agriculture. And in every facet of his reign for a good part of 52 years, the favor and blessings of God were upon Judah and it flourished. And then Zechariah died. There was a void, a vacuum. And Uzziah became arrogant. Allah unto himself. He was not inquiring of the Lord. He did not invite or engage another prophet to speak into his life. 
And he did something that was only intended for the office of a priest. I guess because he was king, he just thought that he could do anything at any time. The Bible said he entered into the temple and he burned incense upon the altar. That was only for the priests. Eighty priests attempted to stop him, but failed. And thus, we come to our text in the year that King Uzziah died because God smote him with leprosy and he died a leper. So let's begin. <clears throat> 26 years ago in the month of July, my oldest daughter, Datha, went to Dallas with me to being a crusade that I was ministering at. And at the end of the Friday, Saturday, Sunday routine, I wanted her to have a little enjoyment, so I took her to the Dallas Zoo. She said, Dad, I want to go to the Dallas Zoo. I really wanted to make the five-and-a-half-hour trip back, but we stopped at the zoo. And it was kind of a safari. We were driving through looking at different types of exotic animals, and we came upon some uh, uh, rhinoceros and some hippopotami. I believe it's the first time Datha ever saw a real live hippopotamus. And sure enough, there was that 1,400 pound, give or take a few hundred pounds, beast right there. There were more than one hippopotami. Datha leaned up in her seat, looked out the passenger's window and said, look at the duck. If she wanted to see a duck, we didn't have to stay in Dallas and go through the zoo. Because at that time, we lived in Minden, Louisiana. We had a little 950 square foot frame house, and just down the street from it was a pond, and I would take Datha down, and we would throw bread to the ducks. So ducks were not unfamiliar to her. But what caught her vision was the duck. And so, I wonder what I am seeing in 2016. I wonder what has captivated my attention and my focus. And I'm wondering if I'm missing something big. Because for some reason, I have picked up something small. You see, as Christians, we will not do ourselves a favor or the world a favor if we bury our heads into the sand and pretend that certain things are not happening in our time. Reading Revelations, the book of Revelation, excuse me, about certain tragic events that would happen to those who had not given up their witness for Christ, and you know what I'm referring to, I just won't go there around, uh, 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 I believe it's Revelation 22. I never thought in my lifetime I would witness such atrocities that are being done right now in the Middle East, and some have happened in America. Physically persecuting someone, I'm go not going to be graphic because I don't want to give the enemy attention. You know what's happening. You know these barbaric, demonic things that ISIS are do is doing. And it continues. And Christians are being persecuted and very few voices are being raised. And then when we look at Pyongyang, North Korea, this young nut job, Kim Jong-un. Ladies and gentlemen, in North Korea, it is not the year 2016. It's probably somewhere around 160, 180. Because it goes back to the granddad's birth. That's how they keep time. The hermit kingdom... And yet they have access to the button to detonate nukes. 
And then we have Tyran, Iran, who boldly states they're going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And we probably should take them at their word, but instead we gave them somewhere around $150 billion. And then last summer, five attorneys, lawyers, wearing black robes, took it upon themselves to redefine marriage. As if there are going to be no consequences. This is H2O. If it wasn't perfectly balanced, H2O, if you took a swig at the very list, it would scald the interior of your mouth and you would not take another swig. Salt of sodium chloride. Separately, if you take those elements that make up sodium chloride, they would just about kill you. But since your blood needs iodine and you don't need salt in excess, you still need a certain amount. And together, they're required. And we probably should understand that since God created and runs and manages the universe, He probably knows how to run the church and the institution of marriage. And now we have... Debt in this country that cannot be paid, no matter who gets elected in November, whether it is a Democrat or a Republican, the debt is not going to get paid. Brother showed me this beautiful child. Did you say two months old? Two and a half months old. What did she do to have tens of thousands of dollars worth of debt bestowed upon her? But that's a fact. We're still wondering what happened to the Egyptian air flight just a couple of days ago. And all of these things are happening on the screen. And I'm just going to say this and move quickly on. Exercise your right to vote in November. You vote the Bible. You vote your conscience. Take your liberty that people bled and died for you to have and vote. But having said that, a man or a woman elected to the office is not going to save the country. With all of these crucial, critical things looming on the horizon, we are arguing over the usage of bathrooms. I have a very strong opinion on that, but all I'm going to say is this. Whenever that is happening and that's all you hear about, the first thing I wonder is, Okay, what's the real bit of news you're trying to distract me from? Because there's something bigger happening here, and you're trying to get my attention. So, I laid it out. I laid it out. So, so, so here's my question. It's easy to get caught up and see all that is happening, and we ought to be engaged in prayer and intercession and travail, and we ought to be praying for the leader of our nation, his administration. We ought to be praying for the leaders of every municipality. We ought to be weeping between the porch and the altar saying, Oh, God, spare thy people. Oh, Lord, send revival. Oh, God, shake Manchester. Oh, Lord, I speak your protection over my family right now, and we are going to keep the sound up because I can't. There's something in the atmosphere for the last two weeks that's been really working havoc on my vocal cords, so, so thank you very much. So, so I, I, I want to just do a few more things before we wrap everything up. Uh, I, I like to take you right now from the beautiful township of Manchester and South Windsor area outside of Hartford, Connecticut, and I'd like to take you and put you in a New York state of mind. So we're going to throw something on that screen here real quickly. There we go. Would you read that? Now, would you take it there? Let's move it. There we go. What did you just read? So you're in a, since it's springtime and on the beautiful East Coast, I've got you in a New York state of mind. Well, I want you to read that one more time. Okay, read it with me. Would you take it down? What did you just read? Yeah. So, 
pretty much all of us, because I heard someone shout it out, pretty much all of us believe that we read New York in the spring. That's not what you read. Oh, just slow down. We go, I feel you. Just slow down. That's the reason why we did it. We did not change or edit that panel, that graphic at all. But you did not read New York in the spring. Now let's put it up this time and let's all take our time together. There we go in perfect harmony. New York in the, the spring. Now take it down. See, ladies and gentlemen, what you, that's, a, that's a brain teaser. That is a real brain teaser. What, what happened is this. Your mind, your brain is this amazing three, four pound computer right here in your cranium. And it has kind of an auto grammar and spell check function that you don't have to initiate. It does it for you. So you see, it did not make sense to read the the in the lower left hand corner of that triangle. So your brain made a deduction and decision for you. So my point is this, I believe that quite possibly in the time that I'm living in, whether it's my brain, my spirit, whatever, something is making decisions for me and I'm seeing certain things, but I may not see what I'm really supposed to be looking at. It's kind of like a 3D image you see. You, the first impression, myriad colors, lines, and patterns. But if you look beyond the first impression, a 3D image emerges. And what I'm trying to do is I want to have the eyes of the Spirit. I don't want to perish, so I want to have a vision. I want to be like the sons of Issachar. I want to know the times and the seasons that I'm living in. And I refuse to believe that the devil gets to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. I believe that God is large and in charge. And I believe the setback is a setback up and I know that these things must come to pass but I it's kind of like this whole bathroom gender issue what are you trying to shield or distract me from I want to see what God is saying and what God is trying to reveal in 2016 would you give the Lord a big hand clap now let me tell you a little bit about myself, and we're going to kind of get on these cues a little bit quicker uh, uh, with our graphics. <clears throat> Let me just share you a little bit about myself. I don't get physiologically upset, depressed, in despair over rainy weather. Good land. That's what we're having. Marilyn just checked the forecast while I went to come to the East Coast. She said, oh, my goodness. It's calling for rain every day. I understand the necessity for rain and everything, but if I had my choice, I would love just to live in beautiful, sunshiny weather. That's pretty close to it. That's really a sunshiny day. We don't get to see any green pastures and stuff, but it's a sunshiny day. And, and, and I love it. I love walking outside and feeling the warmth of the sunlight, the brilliance of it. I absolutely love azure skies and rolling green pastures. And every year when I come up, I take time to drive through your little two-lane blacktop roads and hang out and, and look at the country. And I, I probably know this area as good as some of you. That is a fact. And can't you just see the glory of God there? Can't you just see God's creation right there? This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad of it. But once again, if you think you're seeing the glory of God, you're not seeing the hippopotami, you're seeing the duck. You think you're seeing New York in the spring. Because here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot more to the glory of God than what you see in that photo. And at some point in your life, you cried, you prayed, and you said, Oh God, show me your glory. Reveal your glory to me. Oh God, reveal it in my home, in my life, and so forth. And so here's the deal. There's so much more right now above the roof of this church that your eye can't see. It's probably going to be a sunny day today. We hope. We're praying for it. But here's the deal. You said you wanted to see the glory of God. The church is saying, Lord, show me your glory. The church is saying, Lord, show me revival. Well, in that photo, you're only seeing one star. 
So in your personal life, in the house, the home, on the job, in college, at school, in the church, in the world, in order for God to reveal more of his creation and glory, he has to adjust the settings and the lighting. And when he does, you don't just see one star. You see at least 100 trillion stars. Sister Patrice, can we go back to that second slide real quickly? Right there, there's at least 100 billion, 100 trillion stars. Orion's belt is there. The Big Dipper, the Little Dipper is there. Alpha Centauri is there. But you can't see it because of the timing and the lighting and the settings. They're out there right now. They have not disappeared from existence. It's just the times that we live in. And when God adjusts it, then you get to see more. That's what I'm saying. And we'll just leave that on there for a while. So before I wrap things up, I just want to know, are there people at Faith Tabernacle today that want to see the glory of God, the creation of God, and the darkness does not scare you, and you don't have to just have a beautiful, sunshiny day. God's allowed to adjust the setting and the lighting in your life and reveal His glory. Would you stand with me all over the house? Because I believe with all of my heart, and musicians, would you join me, please? I believe with all of my heart that God planned this from the get-go. I believe that you are going through certain things in your own lives that God is orchestrating. Let's come musicians. And he is simply setting things up so that he can reveal his glory to you. Hallelujah. Just bring the music in. And we're not going to refer to any text on the screen. But would you finish the first part of my sen the sentence of my text with me? In the year that King Uzziah died, I, I, I saw, you saw, he saw what? That's not what he said. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Saying I saw the Lord connotes, implies, infers something entirely different. It's like if you begin a chapter in the Bible that starts with a conjunction and, you're required to go back to the previous chapter and find out why did he put that in there. If he just would have said in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord. It's one thing, but he said in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord. What he's saying is, I didn't miss it. I wasn't naive or in denial. I saw a mighty man, a valiant man, a great leader. For nearly 52 years, almost his entire reign, please the Lord. But I didn't come to give my eulogy simply articulate the negativity. He fell from grace. He got exalted and he died a leper. That's not what he said. He said in the year that King Uzziah died I saw also the Lord and if he would have simply stayed on the duck, he would have missed the hippopotami. If he would have simply read it one time and said, New York in the spring. If he would have been naive and just saw a beautiful sunshiny day and thought, well, that's it. But he stared at it and said, there's more here than what meets the eye. And this is what he wrote. He said, 
I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up in his train. Filled it. Listen to his words. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. With two he did fly. And one cried unto another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the whole house was filled with smoke. You're going to see something else in your home. The financial situation you're trying to navigate through, you're going to see something different. And the church needs to take one more look and say, God's got this. Something really cool is about to happen. You see, for the earth groans and the creature waits with great expectation for the manifestation of the sons of God. You see, right now, you are marginalized, ostracized, criticized. You are branded a right-wing religious bigot, radical, all the other terms. To it. But God's going to adjust the lighting and the settings around the world and right here in America. And the stars are going to be revealed. Not on a red carpet in Hollywood. But you, 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 and you, and you. Because Daniel said, They that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. They will shine as the brightness of the firmament. I believe that God's going to shake this earth. I believe that the glory of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I believe that more are going to come to God at the midnight hour than have come to God in previous times, seasons, and hours. I believe that we're on the brink of the greatest breakthrough the world has ever known. No wonder the enemy is doing what he's doing. I believe that ISIS is a manifestation of a devil who is scared to death. Why would you say that? Folks, I'm not a Dr. Phil type. I am not of his ilk. But a whole lot of things stem from fear. Anger comes from fear. Jealousy comes from fear. There's just a whole lot of stuff that have to do with fear. And I believe that since God has not given us a spirit of fear, but there is a spirit of fear, well, the devil must have originated it. And I believe the fear on the world is his own fear. He's trying to superimpose on the world. Why would he be afraid? Because he knows the clock is ticking and it's almost over. So I believe that ISIS is a last ditch attempt, desperation on the devil's part to try to incite fear. But we will not be afraid. We will live in peace because we know that God is not only a God of the daytime, he cloaks himself in darkness. Would you give him a big hand all over the house? If you don't mind, I'd like to pray a prayer over you. If you would like to see the glory of God in any situation and in any season, would you raise your hands right now? Even if you're a guest, would you mind raising your hands? And in your own words, ask Him, Oh God, I want to see your glory. Oh God, reveal your glory in my own life, in my home. Lord, if the situation I'm going through, whether it's physically, spiritually, emotionally, or financially, if, if it is meant to reveal the glory of God in a greater way, then Father, I pray have your way. And Father, if you are allowing certain things to happen for the glory of God to be revealed in America, I say have your own way, Jesus. Have your own way. And all of God's people said amen. I sense a hunger in this house today. Do you? I sense a strong, strong hunger at Faith Tabernacle today. I believe that we ought to entertain His presence one more time. We are having another amazing year in the miraculous. I'm talking things like leukemia and so forth. Just a few weeks ago, I was off preaching in Maryland. Forward a text to me from a pastor's wife, friend of my wife's. And it said, please pray for so-and-so. He's 10 years of age. His husband 
or excuse me, uh, his father and his mother are on our ministry team and they just discovered at the Baton Rouge Hospital a large mass in the center of the 10-year-old boy's chest. So I looked at the text, I read it, and I believe that God can use me to speak through this microphone on the telephone. I believe that God can use a text message mode to heal. So I set the text out in the name of Jesus. Now, it wasn't just me, many people praying, but I said, in the name of Jesus, we command that mass to go. The medical personnel at the Baton Rouge Hospital felt it so necessary, so critical, that they put the 10-year-old and his mama on a jet, flew them to Memphis. It's not a real long drive to Memphis, but they flew mom and boy to Memphis to St. Jude's. And a few hours later, we get the next text. Praise God. There is no mass. Now, he is going through some treatment, but there is no mass. I like to have a divine healing service at Faith Tabernacle today. I'd like for every type of illness and so forth to be healed by the power of the Holy Spirit here today. But before I do, I'd like to talk about some things that I think that we or I have taken for granted. Because there may be people here today who don't understand what's going to happen when people are prayed for for healing. Matter of fact, they may wonder if they're a candidate for healing. So if you don't mind me just kind of setting the ground rules in place, first of all, who can be healed? Anyone can be healed. Even if you're not a member of Faith Tabernacle, even though this is a Pentecostal church, whether you come from a different denominational background or attend no church at all, if you need healing, we'll pray for you for healing today. And then you might be thinking, but I don't deserve healing. No one here deserves healing. No one here deserves healing. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ at Pilate's Judgment Hall received stripes on his back so that you could be healed. And he didn't do that just for members of Faith Tabernacle. Well, the next question is, I don't know if I have faith to get healed. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is Lord of all? Then you have faith. Have you been worshiping some with us today? Maybe not as demonstrative as others, but you've been participating in the worship. That's an expression of your faith in God. So the next question is, how do I release faith? This is where I have not explained enough of this in 30 years of plus of ministry. Releasing faith is not a supernatural act on your part. Matter of fact, whenever anyone is healed... The person involved did nothing supernatural to bring that to pass. Nothing. Acting in faith, initiating faith, speaking faith, reaching out in faith is not a supernatural act. It's simply inviting Jesus to come and heal you. So, how is this all going to happen? Because I've never witnessed this before. Well, let me demonstrate it here real quickly. Is it Jeremiah? Jeremiah? Come over here, Dad. He doesn't mind if I use him. Let me just show you. So let's just say this is Jeremiah's first time to ever get prayed for. So since I'm a, well, he, for intents and purposes, it's his first time. So since I know it's Jeremiah's first time, Jeremiah, right? Since I know it's his first time to get prayed for, I'm not going to coerce or push him what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, so what's your name? Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, what do you need to be prayed for? And we're going to give you a headache today. But it's not going to be bad. So he says, I've got a headache. Headache. Well, I'm going to pray for him to have a headache. But what if Jeremiah had something wrong with him that would be of a personal nature? And he would be embarrassed to say that. He can simply say... God knows. Because if he says God knows, we'll never know. And he doesn't have to say it's personal. 
It's something that I'm embarrassed of. No. If he says God knows, that's it. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, Jeremiah, raise your hands. And I'm going to very gently pick a spot right here. God just left the forehead bald for a reason. I don't know about you, but man, when someone goes to pray for me, don't come up and get your hand on the back of my head. I, I, I don't like that. I have a lot of idiosyncrasies and, and, and personal, you know, all this stuff going on in my head too. And number two, even if you lay hands on the right spot, I don't think you need to give me a whiplash. So what I do is I simply say, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pronounce healing upon you. That, that, that's how I do it. But if Jeremiah said to me, uh, I have a doctor's appointment scheduled because I'm worried about this, you know what I would do? I would say to him, Jeremiah, keep that doctor's appointment when I'm through praying for you. Why? Because Jesus told the lepers, show yourself to the priests. The Bible says, prove all things. So you know what I would do? I would simply say, now, Lord Jesus, let the headache go from Jeremiah right now. And Jeremiah would say, thank you, Jesus. And then he would check his head, and hopefully he's not feeling any headache because you didn't have one before you walked up here, right? Amen. Amen. You don't have one now. Hopefully not. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> See, that's how we pray for the sick. Now, how many of you, this includes our guests and our members, how many of you have something on your body or in your body that you would like to have Jesus touch? It may not be a life-threatening illness, but you could use a tune-up. Raise one hand. Boy, you got some healthy folk around here. But that's cool. Because Pastor didn't put up, no wonder he didn't put up his hand. Lean, mean, preaching machine. Lean meat administration machine. Lean mean graphic machine. Okay, you can put your hands down. Now, how many of you, you may have already raised your hand, have a family member or a friend who could use a healing today? Raise your hand up. See? See? You can put your hands down. So this morning, we're going to pray for those who need healing who are present. But we're also going to take time to pray in proxy. You could stand in place of someone. The second type of prayer is a current prayer. He said a current prayer is the second type of prayer that God answers. It's, it's a situation that you do not have, you don't have a long time for God to do this. You need God to do it now. Does that make sense? Yeah. You, you can have a lost loved one. You can, that's a memorial thing. You just pray until God does something, but you could have a situation where you need God to intervene now. And when you have that type of prayer, memorial prayer is not what you need. You can't just go bring the name up or bring the situation up in passing and say, God, I'm making another payment on this. I need you to come through. When the situation is desperate, it requires desperation in your prayers. A current prayer. You can't come with a situation, Brother Grant, that's tragic and real and severe and come to God and give God a, you know, Lord, what we're going through right now. And I need you to come through because the deadline is this week and we have to answer. We need some peace. We need a miracle and walk out. That's, there's no desperation there. You're giving God the right facts, but you're not giving God the heart behind the facts. You're showing God, I'm really not serious about this. Because a current prayer requires desperation. It requires you to be, I need an answer now. I don't have 60 years to pray about this. We need a miracle in our house. That is desperation. That's a current prayer. And a current prayer, God will hear. And I want to show you something. That, that the Lord answers prayers while you're praying them. I know that we've got God in this box that if I pray today, he can come through by Thursday or he can come through by tomorrow. He can come through by next month. But actually God, the Bible said, I can hear you before you and say what you're going to say. In fact, I need Jesus. I know what you're saying before you even ask.